And we welcome you to the call, Dr. Fred Templeman, esteemed board physician, board certified physician, and had family practice for years. And uh, Dr. T, you're going to share with us uh, some great information about gut health today. We're very excited for that. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you from Thailand, coming to you live at ridiculously early in the morning, but Dr. J. Frederick Templeman. Fred, thanks for being with us. Thank you very much, Dave, and welcome, everyone. It's great to be with you again at your product call. And what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, briefly, and uh, attempting to render it to understandable terms is something that is very, very important in medicine and has been receiving a great deal of attention over the past few years, not only in medicine itself, but in supplementation as well. And that is something which we call the microbiota. And the microbiota refers to the 34 billion microorganisms that live on and mostly in our body and which have a symbiotic relationship with us. By symbiosis, I mean that we benefit from their presence and they benefit from our presence. And so we'll not be talking about the and by the way, these microorganisms are largely bacteria. That's what we talk about principally. But there are also fungal organisms. There are also viral organisms and even parasites. And in some strange ways, which we can talk about in a different uh, presentation, parasitic hosts. We are the host of all of these parasites because, in a sense, we are the substrate upon which they exist. They exist principally in our gut. And when you look at, I, I said, 34 billion, 34 billion, so multiple times the population of the earth, those bacteria exist in our gut principally, about 4.4 pounds on average for an adult person and they are extremely important and the interesting thing is that we're only just now beginning to appreciate the tremendous importance that they do have because as little as 20 years ago the term microbiota while it existed was not anything that had a great deal of knowledge or research attached to it. And in fact, it was not a term with which even physicians were necessarily familiar. But it has gained such momentum as science has begun to realize the role that it plays in human health and in disease that I believe that over the next very short period of time, it may well be uh, called an organ system. Now, that would put it on par with the digestive system, even though it exists in the digestive system principally, it is not the digestive system, although it has a very, very important role in helping us to digest food but it is a separate organism which is open to manipulation and that manipulation comes largely through <clears throat> the dietary choices that we make but there are also some important impactful factors such as antibiotic use and i will talk a little bit about that and we'll also talk about how this microbiotic community contributes to our health. And briefly, we could say that it helps us to resist disease because it produces antibiotics against uh, those particular bacteria, which may be found in our gut, but be kept under control by the competitive atmosphere of other elements in the gut but which may be pathogenic, so that if they overgrow, as is very often the case 
of a, one of those class of bugs called <coughs> C. difficile. And that is generally the case when there is a, an antibiotic course of treatment which is intended to kill only pathogenic bacteria, but unfortunately will also damage the microbiota. And although in most cases, the gut bacteria can recover, at times that may take up to 100 days. And there are some periods in life when this microbiotic community is at greater risk than at others. Because one of the other things that it does to help protect us against infectious disease is that it literally trains our immune system. And when inadequate training takes place, or when the proper players in terms of bacteria are not represented in the numbers or the proportions that are required, then the training of the immune system or the proper functioning of the immune system simply does not take place. Now, mostly in adulthood, but sometimes in childhood, there are a whole class of diseases which are called, <coughs> excuse me, which are called, uh, yeah, certainly, I'm having a, a, just a senior moment there. But these diseases are autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune means that something has gone wrong with the immune system, principally the function of the immune system, which is called inflammation. And that inflammation, rather than being directed at invaders, is improperly directed at human tissue in the host itself. And this is what happens when you have an inadequately trained immune system. So when does the immune system get trained? Well, the answer is in infancy. Now we do not know for certain whether there is the beginning of a microbiotic community in the developing child or not. But we do know that as soon as the moment of birth, very important things need to happen to expose that child to the kinds of challenges that exist environmentally so that it can have an immune system which will develop properly and which will be able to protect it during adulthood. So when you look at this, you talk about birth. And one of the things that has been of great interest in the last few years has been the fact that there are increasing numbers of cesarean sections going on around the world, but principally in developed countries and more especially in the United States. And that taking the child out through the abdominal wall, through a surgical incision, does something very, very bad to the child. And we now have the epidemiological uh, studies which prove that children who are born by cesarean section miss out on the passage through the birth canal, the, vag the vagina, where there are a host of these microbiotic elements which the child needs to be exposed to and which cannot be exposed, they cannot be exposed to if they are taken from the mother's body through a surgical incision in the abdomen. Now, we've even gone so far in attempting to rectify this obvious deficit by giving the child exposure to vaginal microorganisms after birth. And that hopefully will be helpful. We will not know for certain the efficacy of such an intervention, but we do know 
that in addition to other considerations, the lack of stimulus for the proper development of a microbiotic community in the newborn baby has pushed us to try and avoid cesarean sections as much as possible. Now let's take a look at another element during infancy, which we knew was extremely important. We could tell from following uh, the pattern of either breastfeeding or not breastfeeding that the infants who were breastfed men made wonderful progress in developing a proper immune system compared to those who were not. And because the infant is developing its immune system, then of course, before the immune system is completely developed, the child is more apt to encounter infectious challenges. And as a result, infancy and childhood are the period of time where we, as intervening physicians, end up giving more antibiotics to these children so that on average, by the time that they are three years of age, an American baby will have been exposed to four courses of antibiotics. Now, many of you may realize this when you have been a parent and know that the child seems to get sick, especially if they have older siblings who are bringing home microbes from outside the house, which can cause problems in the body from school. So children who are first born do a little bit better in terms of the number of challenges that they face than children who are subsequently born and have older brothers and sisters. We also have much study that shows that children who are raised on farms and who are exposed to a much broader range of antibi excuse me, of microbiotic organisms, that they develop healthier immune systems. And while they may have the same number of infections during childhood, when they are adults, they are relatively immune in a more efficient way because their immune systems have developed in a healthy environment where there are challenges, but not only challenges from without, but where the adequate development of immune communities in their guts are there to protect them. Because as I suggested, amongst other things, they produce antibiotics. Now there are certain vitamins, for example, vitamin K, which we are incapable in our own body of manufacturing or extracting properly from the food that we eat. But thanks to these bacteria which exist in our gut, we can have them formulate this vitamin, which is extremely important for human health, and we can then absorb it. Now, if this is the case, if this is the case that we have these two kilograms of bacteria living in our gut, then knowing that if we give our children antibiotics in their infancy, that we are susceptible, uh, we are making them susceptible to malfunction in the development of this community, which is very evenly balanced between good guys and bad guys, and if you upset that by turning the uh, antibiotic effect of the, anti of the medicines that we give them into something which will disrupt that equal balance, then you can have an overgrowth of the bad bacteria in your gut and you can have serious problems. Now let's just take a look at a few of the autoimmune diseases, only in passage, just to mention them that develop in the gut principally. Gluten-induced enteropathy, which is in the news a great deal now, is something that does not exist if there is not 
this imbalance already in the immune system, which has decided that gluten is something bad, and yet it's almost omnipresent in many of our grains and other things that we eat, so it's difficult to avoid it. But for people who have been sensitized to it because their immune system is already dysfunctional, and that may have happened, by the way, in their infancy when they were given courses of antibiotics. What for? Earaches. Now, one of the most difficult arguments that I ever had with my patients was the idea that it was difficult to tell without substantial investigation and wasting of time or waiting for growing out the bacteria which may be present in human fluids when there is an infection. I used to have to argue with my mother's two points that they did not want to hear. And that was that most viral infections would not cause enormous harm to their children and that the body would look after it through the immune system and the antibodies that we can develop in a healthy immune system against the viruses which get where they're not supposed to be. That was one problem because they, nor I, in the early clinical appearance, could not tell sometimes the difference between a bacterial and a viral infection. And so the mother wanted me to do something. Please, do something. And many, many primary care physicians, pediatricians, and family doctors would succumb to that pressure and give an antibiotic, even though they knew and understood that the organism they were treating, a virus, was probably not going to be helped in any beneficial way by giving the antibiotic. But during the early years, they used to say, well, you know, the antibiotic's not going to hurt because unfortunately, it's only been recently that we did understand what the impact is of giving courses of antibiotics to infants who are developing their microbiota that that may last a whole lifetime. It may predispose them to many, many illnesses which do have an immune component to them. For example, never mind the fact that we have Crohn's disease, that we have gluten-induced enteropathy, that we have what we would call ulcerative colitis, but also many other kinds of colitises, and a whole porridge, if you wish, of other conditions affecting the gut, which we do not know how to differentiate, and so we will call irritable bowel syndrome. And we do not, and we did not, years ago understand the relationship to these kind of autoimmune situations and the early infancy administration of antibiotics or the risk of hurting the developing child's immune system by giving courses of antibiotics during their childhood. So we caused the problem. Now, there's another problem for the whole of society that comes from the fact that we use antibiotics improperly. Not only doctors using them improperly because of parental coercion or a doctor just wanting to, quote, cover his bases, but also because we know now, and we knew it experimentally, but now we understand the reasons for it that we give 70% of our antibiotics used in North America, yet given to the animals which we are going to consume. And the reason for that is purely commercial. If you feed antibiotics to animals which are sold eventually as human food, 
by the pound, it is going to make good sense to spend cheap antibiotics to get weight gain. Now that weight gain may not come in the form of lean body mass, but then we know that the very best steaks are those that are marbled through with fat. And the butcher does not separate the fat from the meat or the chickens carcasses that he is preparing for human consumption. And so he wants to have lots of weight. The farmer wants to have lots of weight. And we as humans are going to consume all kinds of animal flesh that is absolutely jam-packed with antibiotics. And this, along with the improper use by medical facilities of antibiotics contributes to what is called or uh, bacterial resistance. So that we now have superbugs. Now there was a time when we really only had one superbug, MRSA, and it was a nasty one. And at its peak, we've been able to do a little bit about it. At its peak, it killed 40,000 Americans per year because it was resistant to all of the antibiotics that we could give to people who were infected with this mutated Staphylococcus bacteria. So we have this very great problem because now there are more than 21 major drug resistant bacterial strains in the United States. And when you go to places like India and China, where unfortunately there is not good health care and where people can buy antibiotics at will without physician supervision, we have far more than that. And there are some horrible monsters waiting out there and they do not recognize international boundaries. They are coming our way. Many of them are already here and causing us enormous problems as bacteria are becoming resistant to antibiotics. And because antibiotics are not used as often as say birth control pills or Viagra or other things such as the Zantac, which we use, which has recently been withdrawn from the market. I'll talk about that in a minute. But those things are reality. And they are nasty realities. And it means that we need to be doing everything that we possibly can, not only in the administration of antibiotics to children and to infants, but also in strengthening our bodies by giving them the supplements, which we know very well make a large difference in how the immune system responds to the challenges from the environment, or we can help our body to re-regulate in the presence of this growing threat of autoimmune disease. And those things are things that we can do relatively inexpensively. They are like a, a program, if you wish, of uh, insurance for a dollar or so a day in most cases, to be able to bolster our own immune system so that we don't have to depend upon things like vaccines and the other things that medicine gives us if we feed our body correctly. Now, I'm far away from the gut. I'm going to go back to the gut. So this community of bacteria principally, which live in our gut, they provide us with the kind of bacterial film that needs to coat our intestinal walls. Because where it is absent through the wiping out of these things by uh, antibiotic courses, for example, we know that the little fingerling uh, villi which line our digestive tract and which are responsible for moving things along and absorbing and increasing the surface area of the gut wall so that we can effectively absorb nutrients 
and the things that our body requires, we know that they are blunted if they do not have these bacterial biofilms, which are considered to be good. Now we have bacterial biofilms in our body that are there literally to prevent the bacteria from being harmed. That's what plaque on teeth is. The bacteria hides under that so that it becomes hard, almost like an enamel that is placed or a varnish that is placed over our teeth and the bacteria can be uh, protected from mechanical removal through tooth brushing and things of that nature and also through the effect of mouthwash etc where we try and clean out the bacteria in the mouth and again we talked about how there are 34 billion in our body but know that there are more antibi there are more bacteria in an individual's mouth than there are people on the planet so we have to have a proper bacterial growth in our mouth in order to be able to start the process of digestion but we have to keep it under control and we have to do that with the body's immune system and some of the things which normally protect us and here's where i'm going to talk about zantac and its ilk and there are many products that are still out there on the market that i have been suspicious of for years and refused to use in my practice except in extreme conditions and those are the acid blocking um, medications that could there are several types uh, some of them are proton pump inhibitors others are uh, h2 blockers histamine blockers but the purpose was to stop the stomach from producing as much acid as it does now the stomach produces hydrochloric acid not only to help with the initial phase of digestion when you have chewed your food and swallowed the chyme and then the bacteria in not the bacteria but the acid in your gut which has a ph of one so that's very very acidic what kind of acid is it hydrochloric acid now you don't need to talk about hydrochloric acid too much for most people to begin to believe this is not good stuff well in the gut it happens to be essential stuff it has to be there as a barrier for the bad actors that get swallowed with our food it has to be there not only to help with digestion but to protect us and so when i noticed that yes i could really help people with reflux I could really help people who had developed ulcers or gastritis by using these proton pump inhibitors like Zola, not Zola, but like Zantac. I was probably doing damage because I was breaking down one of the barriers to the entry to the body where we don't need bad actors. And if they are killed, by the hydrochloric acid in the stomach, then they cannot get into the body where they shouldn't be and cause infections. So another case, one of many, where medications may be contributing to the disease burden that we actually go through. Now I'm going to come back again to, no, not to that exactly, but I will make mention of it because I'm going to talk about something else. So we have this community of bacteria which live in our gut. They need to be balanced, good guys and bad guys. We need to be feeding them the proper things. These are called probiotics. Most of them are fiber, soluble and insoluble fiber, uh, uh, carbohydrates. And when we do not eat appropriate amounts of this or when we eat the wrong kind of thing we favor the development of certain of these families of bacteria in our gut and some of them while they can do the work that we require they may not do it nearly as well as the other families which live alongside them but which get shunted aside because we don't eat what they need to eat so diet is the most important element 
in keeping and maintaining an appropriate antibiotic, excuse me, a bacterial mix in our gut. And most of us, unfortunately, do not eat properly. We feed those bacteria which can function somewhat, but which do not do the job optimally. And so now, now in these last two decades, we have learned how and why diet contributes to disease. We don't completely know it, but one of the pearls which has just come down the tube and has uh, yet to be absolutely verified, but we know, for example, that there are diseases in the brain, which we always wondered, how do they get in there? Because there is a very effective blood-brain barrier that stops things from getting from the body's circulation through and into the brain. But the fact of the matter is that there are autoimmune situations in the brain, multiple sclerosis is one of them, and that this appears now to have been in development, not in the brain, but in the gut. And that these little diseased particles migrate not through the blood to the brain, but through the nervous system by going retrograde up the vagal nerve into the brain. So we usually think of nerves as being passageways for impulses and electricity, but they can also serve as a conduit for certain things to get past the defenses of the brain and into the brain and cause the same disease that in the gut is not terrible, but in the brain can be deadly. So you can see how important the microbiota is. You can see that we need to do everything we can in terms of lifestyle and medical practice and the diet that we choose to make sure that we optimize this community so that we have more of the best actors and that we eliminate the others. Now, let me give you a little bit of information about something that most of us are worried about. We have a, a terrible obesity epidemic in the United States of America. 70% of people are either overweight or obese. Uh, until very recently, for the first time in my adult life, I am not in that category. So I'm in the 30% of people now, finally, finally, after doing something like losing a lot of weight, which is as hard as I've said before, like changing your hair color with the force of your mind. Nonetheless, it has brought incredible benefits to me. I have diseases such as uh, diabetes mellitus, which when I eat the wrong foods, it gets fed. The resistance to my insulin increases, my pancreas becomes less and less effective as it works harder and harder to try and keep that very narrow balance of homeostasis. But now that I weigh a great deal less, I am not using even one twentieth of the amount of insulin that was necessary for me to maintain proper sugar balances in my body in the past. There are many other things that will be going on in my body because there are all kinds of carbohydrates that I used to eat, which mm, they tasted so good that I ate them even though I knew they were bad for me. And what did they do? Well, they helped fuel this positive feedback cycle between the gut and the rest of the body that leads to obesity. Now, there are lots of animal studies that have been done that confirm the fact that the microbiotic makeup of fat people is very, very different than those who are normal weight, just in the same way 
that the microbiotic makeup in the intestines of vegetarians is very, very different than people who are omnivorous and who eat meat or carnivores. So we know there are things we can do. We have personal experience, if we wish to do it, to prove that it makes a difference in autoimmune disease, to prove that with the idea of supplementation and proper diet, that you can reduce the amount of chronic low-grade inflammation, which is responsible for most of the illnesses that carry us away as adults in the United States. So what has industry, the supplement industry as well, tried to do to rectify this? Well, we ran so fast that we did not take science into account. And we ran so fast that we played on the gullibility of people who believed that they could alter significantly the microbiological in uh, the, the, the community in their gut by adding through the mouth billions, if you wish, of live bacteria, the kind that we wanted. So it was again, it was again an attempt not to go back to the source of the problem, but to hopefully be able to do something like giving, or giving good stuff in order to be able to make up for the body's inability to produce the proper things. And we did it badly. And I will say this very clearly, and I doubt that anyone is going to be able to prove me wrong. All of the products which you can afford, which are on the shelves of stores, drug stores, and which carry the term prebiotic and probiotic, they are essentially useless. Essentially. First of all, it doesn't make much sense to try and cram the right stuff in if you're going to keep eating wrong and if you're going to have an environment in the gut that will kill them off just like it killed off the ones that we wanted and which weren't there. The science of replacing the bacteria that we need in our gut is far from perfect. And all of these bacteria, virtually without exception, belong to a, fly, a class of bacteria that are called anaerobes. In other words, they cannot stand oxygen. If they are in the presence of oxygen, they die. And there are very few that are facultatively uh, anaerobic and also uh, aerobic, very few. And those are out there and they're in the products, but we don't know exactly what good they do. So when you have someone who promises to have billions and millions and billions and millions of live bacteria, and then they stick them in a little capsule. And that little capsule cannot keep out the oxygen. And the oxygen is everywhere. And it is poisonous to those billions and billions and billions of live organisms. What do you think you get? Well, you get billions and billions and billions of dead bacteria. Now, will they help the gut? There's some evidence that they may, even dead, that they may provide the antigenic response from elements that are in their cell walls that will stimulate the immune system in a beneficial way. So even dead bacteria may do some good in the body, but they certainly don't do what they are promised to do because they can't make it through as anaerobic elements, the shelf life of sitting in a bottle in a little capsule that is not impervious to oxygen. And then secondly, 
if there are simply the way the Chinese used to fight the war is by sending in hundreds and thousands of troops because they had more than anybody else. And then if only a few of them got through, they might still win the battle. That if there are some live bacteria that hit the body, they then have to go through the pH of one of the hydrochloric acid in the stomach and evidence shows that the majority of them cannot. So we've used the hype about the microbiota to get people so excited about being able to take things which will make it all better, and that promise hasn't been able to be kept. Now, science does help us. It helps us in the way that we select the bacteria that we can put into our body because we're beginning to learn who are the good actors, what they do, and who needs to be there. That's something we didn't even know in the beginning of the probiotic era. We also know that there are certain forms of these bacterial messengers that can survive the acid of the gut, that can survive the oxygen in the environment on the shelf where they are stored, and which when they get to the gut can blossom and become what the gut requires. Or we're gonna be talking to you about that in the near future. I could go on and on, but I think I already have gone on and on far longer than I intended. But this is such an exciting area. I'm looking at all kinds of studies about this. The scientists that are involved in developing your products are doing the same. And we're doing it to keep the promise that we have always made to you. And that is that when there is something that science tells us, which will make our products better, we will change our products to reflect those scientific advantages. So this is Dr. Templeman signing off from Thailand on this Monday evening and wishing you all the very, very best. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. T. Thanks everybody for being with us. Uh, tell your friends about these calls. Great information coming. Fred, have a great rest of your day that heads up tomorrow. You're already into Tuesday. Thanks for sharing your Monday night with us. Bye-bye.